Hi everybody, I'm Jessica Steffens. Um, I am part of the Karen Share team here at First Washington United Methodist Church. I have been part of this congregation since I was a child and me and my four kids are all members here as well. Um, so I would say probably 25, 30 years I would imagine. So anyhow, um, I was called to be part of the Karen Share team about a year to a year and a half ago to help Carla Campbell um, and kind of take over some responsibilities um, that she has um, graciously um, completed. Um, but then COVID hit and we kind of got put on hold. So now I'm hoping for some normalcy and to get back into the Care and Share team. And part of the Care and Share team is being able to um, delegate, work with, dictate all the other branches of the church. Um, I have been helped by our congregation, um, especially in the last couple of years. And so I felt it was my obligation to our congregation and church family to be able to give back um, a little bit of my time and, um, and my work to be able to help others um, in our family. So um, the best way to get a hold of me is by text message or phone call. And my telephone number is 314-265-1276. Email is JLE, all lowercase, 011681 at hotmail.com. Hey everybody, welcome to Worship Happy Sunday to you, or maybe it's Monday, Tuesday, I don't know. Whenever you're checking this out and you're worshiping God, you may be on demand right now. Uh, because your time was in demand on Sunday, but we're just glad that you're worshiping with us today. Glad you got an opportunity of hearing what Jessica had to say. Our care and prayer team, if we, if we can do anything for you, whether it being um, bringing you meals, uh, bringing you food, uh, or just praying with you, uh, on our website, firstwashingtonumc.org, you can go over to the, the prayer request page and, and know that you can put in a prayer request. It's coming to us. We're going to be praying for you. And so I hope that you will do that maybe even right now. You just jump on that website. Go to if you have something that is on your heart that you want us to pray for. She does a great job with making sure that uh, our ministries are taken care of, you're taken care of. Uh, you know, God has, Jesus said in, in the Bible, uh, if you take care of the least of, me, of those, you are a reflection of me. If you are, if you're feeding the hungry, if you are uh, clothing the naked, if you were taking care, you were taking care of me. And that's, we take that very, very seriously here at First Washington United Methodist Church. So glad that you're with us. Welcome to worship. There it was. I heard all the woos. I'm so glad that those of you, and, and if this is your first time online with us and you're going, what was he just talking about? We get excited about worshiping Jesus here. And whenever, we, uh, whenever I say welcome to worship, it's been an, uh, an on-standing thing since I've arrived here about two and a half years ago. When I say welcome to worship, you give your best Ric Flair woo, like you're going to get excited about worshiping Jesus with us today. So I hope you did that. I hope you're getting excited about what you're getting ready to, uh, to hear. We are going to sing a couple songs. We're going to pray. We're going to hear a passage of Scripture. We're in a really, it, it's been a deep study and had a lot of people thinking over the course of the last few weeks. Uh, the social dilemma of church and some of the things that we've talked about were the social dilemma of church and, and connecting and um, fellowship, doing life together, all those things. What, what scripture has to say about it? And today we're going to be talking about a great big word that is, is, is one of those things that have been going on since the beginning of time is prioritizing our lives and, ha make, and not just making time for God, but having a time of relationship with God and what scripture says about that. I would love for you to go to the Lord with me in prayer. And then we're going to stand as you are able, wherever you're at, and we're going to sing our first song. So let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you so much for bringing us here today. Lord, I just ask that wherever we are, whatever day it is that we're watching this, if this is Sunday morning and this is our worship service and we have found a time to, to make you that priority on this Sunday, Lord, I, I ask that whatever is going on in our lives, we just clear our minds clear our hearts so that we can just intently hear you 
speaking to us. Maybe it's a, a different day, not Sunday, and we weren't able to worship on Sunday, but we, here we are on a, on a Tuesday evening, or, or maybe it's a Friday morning. Maybe it's Saturday, and we just want to worship you. Whatever day it is, God, we know that you are there. We know that you are, are right here, and we are glorifying you and giving you praise and worship. And for some of us, we're coming to you just saying, Lord, we need some answers in our lives. We, we are struggling here. God, I just ask that whoever is watching this today, that you pour a blessing out upon them. God, may we go through this worship service knowing one thing. This is a worship service and that we are giving all glory to you. And it's in your name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Now is a great opportunity of us giving back, of us giving our finances, our financial gift back to God. Several different ways you can do this. Here at this church, you can do it by going to our Give option online, firstwashingtonumc.org is where you would find that. You can send it in as a check, or, or uh, that's preferable, you know, if you want to, I wouldn't recommend sending cash. Uh, to 4349 St. John's Road here in Washington, Missouri, 63090. Or you can do text to give with the number that is on the screen. I'm just asking today that you give knowing that your financial gift is going to be multiplied by God to do some mighty, mighty works, not only in this church, in this community, but around the world. Your financial gift is something that is a calling from God and we do this and, and we say, thank you, thank you, Lord, for blessing us. Now we're going to give this financial gift so that you may bless others. Gracious God, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the opportunity of just blocking out anything that has gone on in our lives up to now. Lord, this worship service, we're going to be talking about prioritizing our life. And Lord, I ask that the words that are about ready to come from, from my mouth, from Scripture, be the words that you intend for us to hear. And Lord, when we hear these words, maybe we make a shift. May we make a change in our own lives to say, you know what? This is important. This is, uh, having a relationship with you is important. It's not just an afterthought. It's just not a, a time of, well, let me see if I can fit God in. This is a, we make this a priority starting today. For some, maybe we've already done that. That's our priority. Maybe that was our, one of our New Year's resolutions is to come to a deeper relationship with you. And God, I just pray for that person that has made that, uh, that resolution that they too will fill your presence each and every day and will continue to grow in that relationship. But for those that do feel like they are drifting away from you or have really never even had a relationship with you, God, I just ask that this day be the launching pad. Be a day in which they say, you know what, this is important. I must have this relationship with God. Lord, I pray for anyone that is suffering, struggling, hurting in any way. Lord, I thank you for your son, Jesus, who came to be with us, who, who, who taught us many things. But he taught us a time when we asked, Lord, how do we pray? Many, many times we ask that same question, how do we pray? What are we to pray about? And God said, this is how you pray. And as a group of people around, sitting around screens, we lift up this prayer to you, Almighty God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right, I'm going to grab my, my Bible here. We're, we're going to get after Scripture today, okay? And we, when I talk about prioritizing, and it being a social dilemma of the church realize that this has been going on for thousands of years ever since the beginning of Christianity of Christ following when Jesus designed the first church he knew that people were going to have other things that were going on in their lives that were going to take the place of a relationship with God I will tell you firsthand that I, I am one that before I went into ministry and even when I got into ministry, there were many times in which I put other things in place of that relationship with God. 
Christianity takes, is a process. It, it takes a while. And I, I will tell you this much also. The longer you stick with it, the closer you become with God, the closer in that relationship you become with Jesus. And you find out that the, the big things that are of today, that they aren't as big later on. When, when you decide to, to give these things to God, when we pray about them, when we talk to God about them, and we ask for His guidance and wisdom. So today we're going to be talking, like I said, about the social dilemma of the church and prioritizing. What are some of the priorities that we have in our life? I mean, and, and knowing, we know that those priorities are going to change. Some of the priorities that you and I have had over the course of, say, even the last year, we know that those priorities have changed. Think about it. And in, in, at the beginning of 2020, we had this priority and that priority. And in the middle of the year, those priorities change. Priorities will change year to year, month to month, day to day, sometimes minute to minute. And, and we know that. God knows that. So what are some of the priorities in your life? For some, it's family, friendship. For some, it's, it's um, making uh, enough money to support your family. For others, it's health care. For others, it's um, staying healthy, getting healthier. I mean, that's the biggest New Year's resolution, right, is, is getting he healthier and eating better. And here we are 20-some-odd days into to the new year. How's that working out? What is, the, what is the social dilemma, though, of the church when it comes to prioritizing time with God? How many of you can sit down and, and honestly say, I spend several minutes a day with God? And if you can, fantastic. That's, that's exactly the route we're going. If you can't, today I hope that we hear in this passage of Scripture that's going to be coming from a guy by the name of Pastor Paul. Okay, and I'll get to him here in a minute. Uh, these words are of encouragement to us of why it should be a priority to make sure that God is in our lives. Not just in our spiritual lives, but in our everyday living, breathing, eating lives. We go to God for decisions. We go to God for advice and guidance. And it's not that we, we say, well, we'll get to God when we can. But that we go to God in all things. So I'm going to ask this question. I asked this question of a couple friends of mine this past week. Why is it such a social dilemma to prioritize God in our lives? And I was really intrigued by their answers, and I, I want to share those answers with you because I think that many of us uh, worshiping here today may think, hmm, as I did. So I asked that question, and the first uh, friend said, well, that's because, I said, why isn't God a priority in the United States? And this, my friend said, well, because God isn't a symbol on the NASDAQ. Intriguing. I thought, what do you mean? Explain more. And he said, well, God can't be found on the NASDAQ, and so many people are, are concerned about their portfolio and how much money they're going to make and, and whether or not they're, they're going to have enough money to retire. And they invest a lot of their time not in a relationship with God or getting to know God, but investing a lot of time in researching how to make more money. And Scripture says that you can't have two gods, that you can't worship both God and money. So very intriguing. You know, that, that is a priority. Priorities are, I'm going to check my NASDAQ. I'm going to check my portfolio. And, and to some, you're sitting there going, well, wait a minute, I, I do that. I, you know, I, I invest and I invest properly and stuff. Nothing wrong with it. I didn't say there was anything wrong with it. I'm just saying those are the things, some things that take the place of, of priority with God. Next friend said, because God may not be part of our power status. Status is a huge thing with people. Our social status. We want to look good in front of other people. Um, some of us want to be powerful people. 
and we want to surround ourselves with powerful people. I'm talking powerful in status, powerful in money, powerful in knowledge. We surround ourselves with people that are powerful, and we do so so much so that we invest so much time that we miss out on that relationship with God. So it got me to thinking both of those are talking about investments. How, so the last question I'm going to ask before we get into this passage of, before I get into this passage of scripture, how much time do we invest in a relationship with our best friend? And some, some of us are going, well, I call them all the time or I text or, you know, we're constantly in contact. Why did God create us for a relationship with Him? A priority might be investing time with God. And if you're already doing that, fantastic. That's, that, like I said, that's great. But if you're struggling with trying to research and find time, or maybe you're even asking, why would I want to do that? Why would I want to prioritize time with God? We're going to find some of the answers here today. Now, I want to frame this up. This is Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. And uh, we're calling him Pastor Paul today. See, the first letter that he sent to the Corinthians was an encouragement letter. Hey, you're doing great. We're going to make it. Uh, you know, this church is really going places. Things a pastor would do. Over the course of time, people started really falling backwards, falling away from God, playing the blame game. They were blaming anybody and everything for what was going on in their lives. Everything that was going on in their lives, from, from their jobs, from their family status, from their friend status, everything was being blamed on God and basically being blamed on Paul for not being there for them. And Paul got fed up. Paul got really mad. And the first four uh, chapters of 2 Corinthians is basically saying, hey, look, people, this is, this is what you have to do. It's not about me. It's about your relationship with God. And if you're falling away in some area of your life, you might want to go to God about this instead of trying to play the blame game or making excuses of why things are going wrong for you. And then he gets to the fifth chapter. And the fifth chapter is where I want to hang today. The fifth chapter is going to talk to us about why it should be a priority for our lives to go find God. Chapter 5, we're going to be in verses 1 through uh, 15. And uh, I want you to just, if you've got your Bibles with you, if you have the Bible app on, on your phone uh, from our, from our uh, First Washington UMC app, you can jump on there. You can find any version you wish. I read from the message version. And if you see anything, circle it, highlight it, write it down so we can come back to it. Because okay, there's several different, what I like to call, golden nuggets about prioritizing your life for Christ. Chapter 5, verse 1. For instance, we know that when these bodies of ours are taken down like tents and folded away, they will be replaced by resurrection bodies in heaven, God-made, not handmade. And we'll never have to relocate our tents again. Sometimes we can hardly wait to move, and so we cry out in frustration. Compared to what's coming, living conditions around here seem like a stopover in an unfurnished shack, and we're tired of it. We've been given a glimpse of the real thing, our true home, our resurrection bodies. The Spirit of God whets our appetite by giving us a taste of what's ahead. He puts a little of heaven in our hearts so that we'll never, never settle for less. That's why we live with such good cheer. You won't see us drooping our heads or dragging our feet. Cramped conditions here don't get us down. They only remind us of the spacious living conditions ahead. It's what we trust in but don't yet see that keeps us going. Do you suppose a few ruts in the road or rocks in the path are going to stop us? When the time comes, we'll be plenty ready to exchange exile for homecoming. But neither exile nor homecoming is the main thing. Cheerfully pleasing God is the main thing. 
And that's what we aim to do regardless of our condition. Sooner or later, we'll have to face God, regardless of our conditions. We will appear before Christ and take what's coming to us as a result of our actions, either good or bad. That keeps us vigilant. You can be sure. It's no light thing to know that we'll one day stand in that place of judgment. That's why we work urgently with everyone we meet to get them ready to face God. God alone knows how well we do this, but I hope you realize how much and deeply we care. We're not saying this to make ourselves look good to you. We just thought it would make you feel good, proud even, that we're on your side and not just nice to your face as so many people are. If I acted crazy, I did it for God. If I acted overly serious, I did it for you. Christ's love has moved me to such extremes. His love has the first and last word in everything we do. Our firm decision is to work from this focused center. One man died for everyone. That puts everyone in the same boat. He included everyone in his death so that everyone could also be included in his life. A resurrection life. A far better life than people ever lived on their own. Now I hope you circled or wrote down some phrases or heard some words in here that are the golden nuggets of why we should prioritize God as part of our, our everyday lives. Whether it be waking up first thing and, and praying, whether it be studying scripture, whether it be getting involved in a Bible study, whether it be worshiping online with others. See, right off the bat, Paul is talking. Now you have to understand, again, Paul is preaching this, or writing this scripture, basically preaching it to people as the pastor. He is saying to them, here's why we must do this. And he starts off with, our bodies are like tents. Have you ever thought about that? Your body is like a tent? How many of you feel like a 10 by 10 pop-up? You get folded up sometimes, you get placed over in a corner sometimes, and when you're needed, you go get grabbed and pulled out by three or four people, and they keep tugging you one way and tugging you another and moving you another way until you finally get propped up, and then they throw a cover over top of you so that you will protect others. Have you ever thought about that, that your body is a tent? And then what happens when your usefulness is over with? They fold you back up, and they put you back over in your cubby hole until they need you again. Do some of us feel like that sometimes? And what he is saying here is our tents can be moved. Our bodies are moved to different places around the world. What's going to happen with that tent on Resurrection Day. See, that's our ultimate goal as Christians, is salvation. And, and for some, you sit there and may even say, what is salvation? That's the eternal life with God. Our, our resurrection body is going to look totally different than by our 10 by 10 pop-up tent body <laughs> that gets placed over to the side and sometimes forgotten until it's needed again. And then we get the phone call. Hey, we need you. No. In resurrection life, God knows you are there. God doesn't forget about your tent. Doesn't forget about you being placed over on the side. God is always with us. I hope that's one of the nuggets you pulled out of that, is that your tent, your resurrection body, is going to, uh, it's not going to be handmade anymore. It's not going to be pushed around by people anymore. It's not going to be dedicated for the service of others. It's going to be dedicated for the service of God because it's going to be God made. He continues on. Uh, he says, He puts a little heaven in our hearts so that we'll never settle for less. I, I want you to ask this question to yourselves today. Where have you seen heaven this week? Maybe it was in a sunset or a sunrise. Maybe it was in another person or in a place. Maybe it was in the clouds or a long walk. Maybe uh, some, for some of you who, who enjoy cold weather, it was the, that crispness, the cold air that you take in, that big breath of cold air that you take in. That's not my type of thing, but, you know, hey, it is what it is. Where have we seen heaven? 
Another passage in here, another part of the scripture says that we, uh, we can't wait to move. We, and so we cry out in frustration. How many of us over the course of even the last year say God can't be with us or else he would have already done something about X, whatever X is in our lives? It could, it could be our health, it could be our finances, it could be the pandemic, it could be anything. God isn't moving fast enough. And therefore, what do we do? We want to play the role of God and move it along a little bit. And God's saying, just wait, just be patient, folks. I know that right now you feel like everything is a priority and everything must move forward. But be patient. I, I found that as one of the biggest nuggets in this passage of Scripture. Friends, I, I am one who likes to move. I don't like to stay still. I, I, I was telling somebody the other day that I feel like I'm, I've, I've got a corona depression, a coronavirus depression, and, and, it, and someone told me that's real. I thought, really? Well, I, I can feel it. And I, and I don't know why. And it's almost to a point where I say, okay, we've got to move this along a little bit. Am I, am I doing what God wants me to do or am I doing what Troy wants to do? And so then we have to have a good conversation, God and I. I hope that you have felt the same way. For many, priorities surround our, our families, our friends. Um, you know, whenever I was growing up um, in the 80s, uh, you know, late 70s, early 80s, we had this thing called the Blue Law. For you kids who are watching it today, and they go, what? None of the stores were open on Sunday. Sunday was about slowing down. Sunday was about going to church. Sunday was about spending time with family. Sunday was about fried chicken, mashed potatoes, and some good old biscuits. Sunday was having fun out in the backyard and playing and, and, and enjoying each other's company. And over a period of time, especially as, as parents, I think what we have decided is that, you know what, we need to speed this up a little bit. Our, our little Johnny or our little Jane is going to be the next best athlete, best dancer, best whatever. And we've taken time away from God of saying, we've got to get them invested in every sport possible. They're going to be a three-sport athlete. <laughs> I hate to tell you, but I've, I, I've known a lot of athletes, and there's only a few of them that even made two sports look good. But we're going to make them a three-sport athlete, and we're going to find ourselves going between game after game after game. And the communication level between parents, between mom and dad, has shifted from, we've got to take this, this child here, you're taking this child here, we'll meet up for lunch, and then you're going to run them to some other place. And we haven't slowed down. And the priorities have become not with God. So if, if you're in that, I, I'm, believe me, I'm not condemning that. I'm just saying this is reality. This is where we are and this is what Paul is talking about. We want to speed things up and when it gets going so fast, we get frustrated. And what he's saying here is, slow down. Enjoy it. Uh, I, I want to give props to, to my daughter, my youngest daughter, Faith. Um, I wasn't going to say this, and, but I, I feel like God is saying, hey, you need to share this. She, she writes, and when she writes, you can just feel her uh, passion through her writing. And she was talking about 18-year-old Faith versus 21-year-old Faith. And when you look back on things and how you look back on life and you go, wow, I, I wish I could just give 18-year-old Faith a hug and tell her that things are going to be okay. Because right now things just don't seem like they're okay, right? Wherever you are in your life, whether, whether you're 18, whether you're 25, whether you're 56, whether you're, whether you're 90 years old, sometimes things just don't feel like they're going to be right. 
I have an expression that a, a friend of mine, a pastor friend of mine, Jim Blue, gave a, a while back. And he said, if it's not going to matter in five years, then why worry about it? I, I've taken that to a different level. I said, if it's not going to affect you in five years, but right now it seems to be the main thing, because we're going to talk about that here in just a second. If it feels like it's the main thing now, but it's not going to have any effect on you in five years, what can you learn from it? If it is going to affect you in five years, what can you do about it? That's your two options. Because see what Paul's talking about here is he's talking to a, a, a group of people who have not made God a priority, made everything else in the world a priority. And it is the it is the dilemma of church today, still. And he says here that neither exile nor homecoming is the main thing. Cheerfully pleasing God is the main thing. When the main thing becomes the main thing, it's the main thing. What is, what is your main thing today? And is cheerfully pleasing God a priority? Or is it cheerfully pleasing me, cheerfully pleasing others? Is it cheerfully pleasing my children, cheerfully pleasing my parents, my grandparents, whomever it might be? It, until we get back to cheerfully pleasing God, we're going to have issues with having Him as our priority. goes on to say that, and this is very important to hear, this is why we must make God a priority. We're going to face God one day. When we pass away and go, go to the other side of wherever earth is, when we go to heaven, we're going to face God. And it, and it says here in this passage of Scripture, we will appear before Christ and take what's coming to us as a result of our actions. Hear that? Of our actions, either good or bad. A lot of people will say, well, if I've sinned and I've asked for forgiveness for my sin and you have said that God forgives sins, then why would I have to come before Christ? He does forgive sins. Let's get that, let's get that right there. He has forgiven every one of your sins. If you've turned to Him and really heartfully said, you know, Lord, I have messed up. Last week we talked about that. Forgiving ourselves forgiving others, and asking to be forgiven. If you've done all those things, He has forgiven you. And He's moved on. When we're talking about Judgment Day, He's going to come in and He's going to say, did you feed that person that was hungry? Did you clothe the person that was naked? Did you take time to have a relationship with me? I know you, but do you know me? And do you know all the things that... You, you had the opportunity of affecting someone's life positively and making a huge impact. Those are the things that we're going to go over with Christ. And it's going to be on us, it's individual. It can't be, this is where we can't place blame on somebody else. And that's what Paul's saying here. Stop placing blame on me and the other, the other leadership of the church or whatever he was talking about here. Quit placing blame and look inside yourself. And then he says one big word, vigilant. That keeps us vigilant, you can be sure, that they're going to see God. That Paul, his church in Corinth, those that are Christ followers, new, newly Christ followers, maybe it's us today. What are you vigilant about in your own personal life? What is that thing that gets you up in the morning? What is that driving force behind you? What is your priority today? And again, remember, it can change minute by minute. But what gets you up in the morning? Maybe if you just reflect on that today. Maybe if we just reflect on that today. What is it that gets your motor started and keeps you vigilant? And what if I asked, what makes you vigilant for God? Again, what part of heaven have you seen this week that God has revealed to each and every one of us? And it's out there. 
We just have to have our eyes open to see it. And then when we do, how do we stay vigilant towards it? As, as far as myself, vigilance comes through part of what Paul's talking about here. He says, we work urgently with everyone we meet to get them ready to face God. That's what gets me going. That's why my feet hit the floor. It's so that I can spread the Jesus in me to the Jesus in others because he resides and lives within each and every one of us. That's what motivates me. And that's what makes me stay vigilant is so that people will know who God is. And that they'll have this pursuit and this passion. And believe me, friends, if you knew me, I'm going to say even 10 years ago, you'd say, that's not the same, Troy. <laughs> well, I guess the reason that struck me when my friend said the NASDAQ report, I was always in the, in the realm of how can I make more money? Money was going to be the solution to everything. And I found out that it wasn't. I became a, a, a pastor because I, I heard the calling from God. And I, I felt the urging from several people, including that same guy that I just mentioned a while ago, Jim Blue, who, who nudged me into ministry. And it wasn't until I got nudged, like I want to nudge you today, dear friend, to pick up the scripture and read it. It's amazing to me now because it, at first it was just like, okay, what does this mean? I get it. But now it becomes a circle and a highlight and an underline and a vigilance for, for seeking out the golden nuggets in gospel and scripture from other people who have experienced golden nuggets of Jesus' ministry and how it affected them and how it can relate to me and it can relate to you. And it says here, our firm decision is to work from this focused center. This is very, very important, friends. If you've stayed with me up to here, and I know that some of you may get have been a little ruffled and that's okay. That really is. Some of us may be thinking now, man, I, I don't have it all together. I thought I did, but I don't. I find myself running from place to place to place and then getting up and doing it all over again the next day. As a Christian, this is the ultimate golden nugget in this passage of Scripture. It says here that our firm decision is to work from this focused center of keeping Jesus in our everyday centered life. It's very important that you hear this as well. Jesus didn't just die for me. Jesus didn't just die for you. Jesus died for everybody. Why? Because we were His priority. We were Jesus' priority. It was the main thing. It was His main thing was to come and save us, mainly sometimes from ourselves, but to save us from eternal hell and bring us to everlasting life with Him in heaven. And it was very important, and it's going to be very important, that from this very, very moment, we realize that every one of us are on the same level playing field. He died for you. He died for the person sitting next to you. If you're watching this by yourself, He died for the person that's on the other side of the screen. He died for me. So that everyone could also be included in His life. A resurrection life. A far better life than people ever lived on their 
own. Until we make Jesus our priority because he made us his. We're going to find ourselves rolling around, wandering around, blame, placing blame, and wondering if we're ever going to be able to hug our 18-year-old self and say, you know what, it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. Whatever trial or tribulation you're going through right now, know that this is temporary and this too shall pass. And prioritizing Jesus. If, if you haven't done this before, again, I'm going to go back to 10-year-old Troy, or 10, 10 years ago Troy. It was very difficult for me to, to include this in my everyday living. I hate to admit that, but I'm going to. And then I started saying, you know what? I'm going to make scripture. And someone will ask, well, where do I start? Start in Genesis. It's beautiful. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is about Joseph. Joseph, how his brothers turned against him, sold him into slavery. How he ended up in Egypt how he got put in jail, how he told dreams and got made second in command of the whole land of Egypt, and the dreams that he told his brothers 20 years earlier, 30 years earlier came true, where they bowed down to him. And how he said one important thing. You sold me off into slavery, but it was God that brought me here to pave the way for you. Friends, there, there's a lot of people in our own lives. Take, take a look back on that. Who are the people in your lives that have paved the path for you to get to this point? Maybe it was an invitation to say, check out this worship service. Go online and worship with First Washington today. It, it wasn't by coincidence that you're here right now. Each and every person that is watching and worshiping God right now through this passage of Scripture that Paul wrote thousands of years ago can hear something in here going, you know what, maybe I need to slow it down. Maybe I need to focus on God. Maybe I need to make God a priority. Maybe I need to take something out of my life to make God a priority. Maybe I'm already making God a priority and I need to expand on it just a little bit so our relationship becomes even deeper. Friends, today is your day to have that relationship with God. Your opportunity to realize that He died for everyone. He didn't leave anybody behind. Also to realize that you and I are priorities in God's image by God's design. You may be struggling right now, struggling with several hundred things in life. It feels like you're balancing balls everywhere. Know that Jesus died for you and for me because we were a priority. How will we make him a priority in our lives starting today, starting right now? That's for each and every one of us to figure out. Let's pray. Gracious God, I thank you so much for all you have gifted to me. Lord, I, I know that I am a sinner. I know that I continue to fall back, but I know that the words of Scripture, I know that your guidance, your love, your grace, your mercy for me and for every person that is watching here today and worshiping with you today is extravagant, is intentional is a priority. God, we ask ourselves today, what is something that we can take off of our calendar and replace it with you? What is some decision 
that is coming up this week for our own personal lives in which we're going to go to you first instead of going to someone else and saying, hey, what do you think? We're going to come to you, God, and say, what do you think? Is this what your plan is for me? Is this, is this what you want me to do? Lord, because we know that one day we're going to see you face to face. And when we do, you're, you're going to judge us on our actions, on our relationship with you. Lord, I thank you for dying that death for me and for everyone that is worshiping you here online today. And Lord, starting today, starting this day, will we put our focus and our priority on spending some time with you, either getting to know you or furthering our relationship with you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. We would love for you to worship with us. Stand as you are able and let's worship God together. Scared Oh, I thought I knew Scared Now I'm so filled with fear I can barely move Doubt I've had my share of doubts But never more than right now I'm wondering where are you that you have been blessed. Have you been blessed today?
Have, has anything here been encouraging or maybe make you even think differently today than what happened? I know it has for me even. Of just, you know, I've read this passage of scripture several times over the course of this last week, and even today I'm sitting here going, wow, Jesus died for me. He intentionally and purposely came to the world to save me, and He did the same for you. May you have a blessed week. May you understand who Jesus is in your life, and may we get back to making God a priority. May we not just sweat the small stuff. And may the main thing that is the main thing in our lives right now, know that if it doesn't matter in, in a few years, what are we going to learn from it? And if it is going to matter in a few years, how can we work towards it? Let's make God that priority. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you again for this day. Whatever day we're watching, whether it be on our regular Sunday worship, if you're here on our Sunday worship, we're so glad that so many people have gathered here today to worship you, to glorify you. God, we just ask that we make you that priority and that the social dilemma of the church and prioritizing who you are in our lives will be lessened this week. That gap will be closed and that you will get to know each and every one of us by name. Some for the, maybe the very first time. Others for the millionth time again. Lord, we thank you so much for your son Jesus. We thank you for his death and his resurrection. And we thank you for our opportunity of having eternal life. And while we're here on this earth, may we positively impact somebody today. And may we not only be blessed, but be a blessing to someone else. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Have a great and wonderful week. We'll see you back again next Sunday. Be blessed.